Hey, I'm Frank, and in this video, I'm gonna show you how to do two different baking methods inside of Substance Painter. One is retopologizing a mesh and utilizing ID maps, and the other one is using the low poly version of your ZBrush sculpt and utilizing geometry masks. Let's get into it. All right, so in this video, it is all based around having an existing high poly asset, and then we're gonna build our retopologized mesh over the top as a single mesh while also incorporating our sub tools as an ID map so that we can project information using those ID maps on one single mesh. So let's get into it. So we want to jump over to the folder that contains all the sub tools that we're going to be retopologizing. It doesn't matter that they're all separate sub tools, you can keep it the same. Uh, I want to merge the group and then we want to decimate it. So the reason that we decimate it is because you could bring the whole model over as a high poly, but all we're using this for as a reference point as a silhouette to draw our new mesh over the top of. So Decimation Master is great for that as it keeps the file size really low. So as you can see there, I've merged the folder and then I'm gonna go up into Z plugin down to Decimation Master and pre-process this. I usually pre-process it at about 20%. It usually keeps the silhouette pretty true to what the actual model is. And what this will do, it'll merge all, what well, our sub tools will already merge, but now it will be one single mesh at a much smaller size. You can see up there 180,000. Now we can bring that over to Maya and draw a new retopologized mesh over the top of it. So now that we've got our decimated model over into Maya, what we wanna do is we wanna make it live. So what making it live does up there on that magnet tells our quad draw in the modeling toolkit that when we click our new vertices onto here, they're gonna to snap to it. So when you left click each of these vertices to bring them onto the mesh, you can hold shift and left click between them and it will recognize to draw a quad there. So I usually like to follow the contours of the mesh that I'm drawing over the top of, as you can see here, just really nice big uh, polys because we can refine it afterwards. It's, it's always better to start lower, like a lower res like this. And then you can hold shift to connect between all of these. So I usually just follow this method, keep going through until I start forming the shape uh, that I wanna be seeing. And then I can start getting into more detail later. A uh, really good hotkey here that you can see is I'm holding shift and just scrubbing over the top of it, smooths out the mesh, is a really good way to get the mesh even. I'm um, holding control and then clicking, will connect a the mesh there like that too. Uh, control shift left click will delete it and then control shift middle mouse button can move it. Uh, holding the tab key along the edge, will extrude the edge the way you can see there. And then over on the bottom right, over in the modeling toolkit, the keyboard and mouse shortcuts are down over there as well in case, if you wanna go through them all. Uh, so down over there as well, you can see the live constraints. So you can actually set that offset if the mesh is getting a little bit difficult to draw your points on. You can actually increase the offset that that goes to. It's a good little tip as well. So continuing around the mesh, just point by point, um, snapping it as you can see there to the highest face because we want this mesh to be over the top of our existing mesh. That's how we're gonna get the best bait. Uh, but for the most part, it is just adding vertices, moving them and drawing them around with nice, with nice edge flow, just to make sure that that blue face is the highest face that we can see, um, because that is gonna be our new render mesh and the one that we're gonna be baking to, so that we want that to be the most prominent mesh that we can see. And when we're retopologizing a mesh like this, a prop, um, one of the best things to remember is the consistency of the mesh. So if we can if we can keep the quads even the way we are, when we subdivide it later, it's gonna be a nice even subdivision. We also wanna keep our topology nice and consistent around the model as well for when we double click those edge loops and cut along the seams to create our UV shells. See, here's a really good example of me redrawing the topology um, in a new loop. So around the thumb hole area, what we wanna be doing is creating the loop, the similar way that you would be doing it around an eye socket uh, or around a mouth on a head. You can see that loop that we're creating there for, this is gonna be where we're gonna want one of our seam cuts get to be. So we want a nice consistent loop around the edge of that thumb hole, and then we can join it up with the other existing topology there. Uh, I've also created a couple of loops because when we're gonna sub subdivide this, we're gonna want a couple of loops around here, just depending on where, we, where we're gonna wanna cut it. Um, but it's also good practice to create a loop around an area where you want to be ha making a cut and then joining it up to your existing topology that you've already done. So as you can see here, I'm just going around and tweaking that mesh 
just to make sure it's at the each vertice and each edge is at the highest point of the decimated model because we want we want our new re topologized model to be on the top you can see here this is the finished quad drawn model that i've done um, it's just a single plane uh, you wouldn't usually need to extrude this to give it thickness um, although i am using it uh, to use it as a bit of a test case on this one so it's going to be matching the exact model that we're going to be using in Substance Painter. So I've just selected all the faces there and hit and extrude. Match the thickness to the decimated model as close as I can. And select all the faces again and invert them. As you can see, those normals are there flipped. So now we have a mesh with thickness that matches our exact height topology. And then we're going to right click smooth it. And then we're also going to soften those edges because that's going to give us a nice clean model for when we bake. Um, so then this is where those loops are going to come in handy for when we're cr cutting our seams to create our UV shells. So just a double click along that edge there and it will go all the way around the top. We can cut that and that thumb hole that we spoke about before, double click that, cut it and then around the top there, cut it. So three simple cuts around the three holes. And now we're going to select the shell, shuffle it to the right. Then we're going to do one more cut along the inside of the glove so that when we run the unfold operation it's going to open along this one side here so another good reason to have good topology is just a simple double click uh, you could usually do this process before you smooth and soften the edges as well so you're actually working with less topology but this was quite low anyway so it was fine to do it either way uh, so then we're going to cut that along there too and you can see that's the new cut down along the side the same way that you would do it if it was in real life, you would need to cut that part between the top of the thumb and the side. I'm going to select all the UVs to shell. And we're over to the right in the modeling toolkit and we're going to hit unfold. And we'll just get a simple unfold there along those cuts to shell, unfold again. And then we're just going to rotate and scale those shells, making sure that we scale them uniformly so they're, they're taking up the same amount of texture space for when we do texture written substance painter, we want the tiling and scale to be uniform across both meshes. So our next task is to bring our high poly in and apply color to each of our subtools. As you can see, they go up to mesh display and then down to apply color. So what we're gonna be doing here is applying colors to our vertexes. So when we load this high poly mesh into substance painter and bake it onto our low poly, this is the information we're gonna be using to create our ID maps. So when our new single mesh goes into Substance Painter, we're no longer gonna have the flexibility of each subtool and selecting it. So this is the way that we're gonna be using it to create masks to be able to region different sections inside Substance Painter using these ID maps. So now we're over into the new Substance Painter 2023. So importing our low poly mesh is exactly the same as it was before. Just go up to new project, select mesh, low poly, Glove low poly is what I've used, and here is the re mesh that we've used. So the one of the differences of 2023 is that little croissant up there on the top right is the baking. You can also go over into the texture set settings the way you used to be able to, and then go down to bake mesh maps. It just takes you to the same thing. I think it's a nice little addition. Um, and then this is pretty much all the information except it's all laid out in one spot. So what we want to do is, I just set it to 2K there, load our high poly mesh in with our newly added vertex color and the new 2023 actually gives you a visual representation of that now high poly mesh overlaid over our low poly so you don't want to be seeing any of those red artifacts you can see there so the way that i've been finding that this is working really well is to grab that max frontal distance and just drag it up to a point where you can't see any red the max rear distance is the internal mesh so you wouldn't be able to see any feedback on that but as you can see here this first bake a lot of artifacts because i've cranked that max frontal up and the max rear so i'm going to just push that max rear way back so that it's not going to be intersecting with the mesh and then as you can see i'll just turn off that visual feedback and then you can see that's a clean bake onto our low poly from our high poly. Only thing we can see is there that our IDs are completely gray because the color source, I did not select vertex color. So now we can just rebake that map. And as you can see, when the IDs are coming through, 
There is now color information because we've told it to pull it from the vertex color. We can go down to the ID and then bang, we've got exactly the same color information that we've got from what we put into Maya. So this cage information is another really cool thing. It's just a visual representation. You can change the opacity of the cage and the wireframe opacity. Just little, you know, tweaky things that make your life a little bit easy depending on the project that you're working on. Just a couple of new interface changes to Substance. But for the most part, it's pretty much the same. It's just laid out a little bit different. Um, this is the part where we, that the ID maps are gonna come in handy. So same way that ID maps were working before, is that we are using them to create masks. So now that we have one single mesh, we have all our sub tools baked into it, but we can't really change it unless we make a mask and draw them out. So the beauty of the ID maps is you can go into mask there and add mask with color selection, and it will automatically plug in our ID map there. And you can color pick the sections that you want, and then it will mask those areas out with that material. You can go up there into the top right down into mask, and you can see exactly what it's doing. So that mask is now just using that color information to create a black and white map over the top. So we can still use our sub tools to create regions. We just need to drive them through the ID map. So the second masking method is the geometry masking. So what we're going to be doing here is using our low poly model in ZBrush and then baking the high poly model on top of that. So instead of retopologizing the mesh, we're just using the one we've already got. So we're going to be doing the UVs in here. So each sub tool I've just uh, unwrapped and doing that, I merged them all together, unwrapped, automatically unwrapped the whole thing and then copied them onto each sub tool like this. There's probably easier ways to do this. It's just a method that I've been using and that way you can keep everything under the one set and make sure that nothing is overlapping inside of ZBrush. UVing is a whole other subject, um, which I'm going to make another video on. But for now, all of the sub tools need to be under one texture set in the one in the one tile. So now we're going to export that low res mesh over into Maya, and that is going to be our the equivalent of what the retopologized mesh was in the previous method. So now we're over into Maya, and this is our now low poly mesh that we're going to be working with our render mesh. Uh, you can go check the UVs and they're going to be exactly the same as the ones that we have in Maya. There's a lot of dead space there as that was the other glove um, under as I had this under one texture set. But for this demonstration we're just doing the one that's why there's a lot of dead space on that UV tile. Um, all of our sub tools still separate pieces so that's the beauty of this method is that we don't have to retopologize. You can keep the mesh exactly the same, use the low poly version um, and then we can utilize our sub tools as our masking method instead of using ID maps. So the way the Substance Painter works is that it recognizes texture sets as materials. So for this whole one piece, we're gonna be using one material for the whole set. So say you had a second glove on a second texture set tile, boots, uh, the body, they would all be separate materials here in Maya. So now what we're gonna do is we're going to name and apply a material to every subtool that's in this. Um, label whatever this is as what the texture set is. So in my case, I'm going to call it glove or left glove Just so when our list of materials are over in Substance Painter, you can see exactly what this texture set is So this is basically the folder. You can sit, look at it like a folder that you're putting all your subtools in So the Substance Painter can read that as what that texture set is um, If you have multiple subtools in here, I usually like to change the color so that you can see what your texture sets are inside of Maya if you had multiple pieces all at once, you can see, okay, this is going to be one texture set, that's going to be another one, which is sometimes why you see a lot of colored versions, um, just as a visual representation of what your texture sets are inside of Maya. So we're going to jump over into Substance Painter now and import that, that low poly mesh that we just had in Maya. So ZBrush to Maya, now over to Substance Painter. All we've done is apply that material and kept all our subtools and the res the same. So we're going to go up and hit the croissant the new bake button and load our high poly exactly the same way we did before. We can still use the exact same mesh with the material IDs as well if you wanted to have that, but for the most part, all of this is the same, except that it is still multiple pieces instead of one single retopologized mesh. So I'm happy to keep all the settings exactly the same as it is, it is the exact same mesh, it's just a different density. So we'll keep it at the point two because that wasn't too bad before and we'll just shoot off a bake and see how it looks. Because those two meshes are quite similar in the silhouette, it's gonna be a pretty easy clean bake as you can see, and we'd already tweaked those settings as well, so pretty happy with that. Um, now the second part of the benefits 
to using this method is the geometry masking. So I'll just set, throw a material on, set that scale, and then hit that dotted box there over on the right of that material. And then you've got a list of all of your sub tools that we had organized in Maya under the same material. And you can check and uncheck which parts of the mesh you want to be affected by the material and not. So it's a little bit more of a visual interface for masking as opposed to clicking and color selecting. You can exclude there, turn the ones on you want, super easy. So this is the final result of all of the textures that I've done using these exact two methods. So I've used a combination of both of them. Uh, different areas require different things, but for the most part for a portfolio piece, I just use the geometry masking method to achieve this. As I wasn't animating it and I wasn't doing anything else with it, I just wanted it for a portfolio piece, that method is perfectly fine. Um, so yeah, if you want to see any more videos like this, make sure to like and subscribe and feel free to hit me up if you want to see any videos, you want me to break anything else down. So thanks for watching.